Today, we will finish examining ideas from Part 9 of Mencius Moldbug's Letter to Open-Minded Progressives, which was published on June 12, 2008. Moldbug describes what he calls a soft reset from the cathedral, in which the First Amendment is applied liberally to institutions. Quote, in a soft reset, we leave the current structure of government the same, except that we apply the 20th century First Amendment to all forms of instruction, theistic or secular. In other words, our policy is separation of education and state. In a free country, the government should not be programming its citizens. It should not care at all what people think. It only needs to care what they do. The issue has nothing to do with theism. It is a basic matter of personal freedom. You cannot have official education without official truth, i.e. pravda. Most, in fact, I'd say almost all of our pravda is indeed true. Call it 99.9%. The remaining 0.1% is creepy enough. The Third Reich used the wonderful word Aufklärung, meaning enlightenment or literally clearing up. Every time I see a piece of public education designed to improve the world by improving my character, I think of Aufklärung. But of course, a good Nazi education imparted many truths as well. There are four major forms of education in a modern Western society. Churches, schools, universities, and the press. Our open-minded progressives have done a fantastic job of separating church and state. I really don't think their work can be improved on. A soft reset is simply a matter of applying the precedent to the other three. End quote. As we went over in the seventh video, the official education system provides students with religious instruction on how to think. If the First Amendment were applied to all forms of education, it would eliminate dogmatic intrusion into education. Quote, First, let's deal with primary schools. This is easy because they are actually formal arms of the government. To separate school and state, liquidate the public school system, selling all its assets to the highest bidder. For every student, in or eligible for public school for every year of eligibility, compute what the school system was getting and send the check to the parents. This is budget neutral for the state and family alike, and unlike vouchers, it does not require Uncle Sam or any of his little brothers to decide what education is. If the worst parents in the world spend the money on Xboxes and PCP, it would still be a vast improvement on inner city schools. The perfect is the enemy of the good. End quote. Moldbug makes this sound easier than it actually would be, but the primary schools aren't really the centerpiece of the cathedral. And, of course, Moldbug does not actually believe that a soft reset would work, but it serves to exemplify how a non-subverted system should work. Quote, this leaves us with the cathedral proper, the press and the universities. The great thing about our understanding of the wall of separation is that it works both ways. The distinction between a state-controlled church and a church-controlled state is nil. In the modern interpretation of the First Amendment, both are equally obnoxious, although I suspect most progressives would find the latter especially repugnant. The same amendment prescribes the freedom of the press, but the freedom of the press and the separation of church and state are applied in very different ways. The suggestion of a state-controlled press evokes terrible fear and anger in the progressive mind. The suggestion of a press-controlled state evokes nothing. Even the concept is unfamiliar. Unless they happen to be Tony Blair, I don't think most progressives have ever even considered the idea that the press could control the state. No points for guessing why this might be. And the same principle applies to our independent universities, except briefly during the McCarthy period, about which more in a moment. No one in government has ever considered trying to tell the professors what to think, just as no one in government has ever considered telling the preachers what to preach. But while professors and preachers are both free to offer policy suggestions, it would be a scandal if the latter's advice was regularly accepted." End quote. This is the major revelation of Part 9 of the Open Letter, and one of the best observations in the entire book. Everyone understands, or at least can imagine to understand, what a church-controlled state is. It looks like the Dark Ages. While the great Catholic boogeyman was not in fact the grand puppeteer of all evil in Europe, it or some other fictitious entity serves nicely as an example. 
For a state-controlled church, there are plenty of examples of that in the 20th century. Either way, there is no freedom of religion. We also understand what a state-controlled press is. Again, the examples in the 20th century alone are innumerable. But what of a press-controlled state? The idea is alien, yet there is no particular reason why the institution of the press shouldn't be able to control the state, just as a religious institution could. Referring to words penned by Moldbug earlier in the letter, quote, If it's alive, but you no longer identify it as a distinct movement, the only possible answer is that it has become so pervasive that you do not distinguish between it and reality itself, end quote. And, quote, well, there isn't really a word for it, is there? This is a good clue that someone has been tampering with the tools you use to think, end quote. We can apply these ideas to a press-controlled state. A press-controlled state, like the idea of an a religion, is an unfamiliar concept. You've probably never even considered it before. You don't see it, and you don't even look for it. But that doesn't mean it isn't there. Syntactically, it's a perfectly coherent idea. So in the spirit of mulling over Moldbug, let's consider the idea at length. When the state controls the press, the press is bounded by certain parameters. It is especially bound in what it cannot publish. A state-controlled press will not have every single publication dictated by the state. In the Soviet Union, there were many lifestyle magazines that were published. The Communist Party didn't need to write its own fashion articles. It just needed to make sure that what it didn't want published wasn't published. The state may also have a few official political publications, perhaps entire magazines, or perhaps individual columns in other publications. Some articles might be guided in the direction of the official Pravda, and others might be insisted to be aligned with it. But overall, it will be journalists doing the ground-level journaling. When the press controls the state, the state is bounded by certain parameters. It is especially bound in what it cannot legislate. A press-controlled state will not have every single piece of legislation and every order dictated by the press. In the United States, there are many government actions taken that the press has no opinion on. The press doesn't need to direct every political action. It just needs to make sure that what is not acceptable is not done and that the goals the press desires are pursued. The press rewards good people with good press. It punishes bad people with bad press. Some people are willing to take the heat. President Trump is. But for the most part, people play the press's game. The press doesn't need to micromanage every single politician and professor. Most people in society will stay within the Overton window on their own, because the press makes an example of people who don't and it even rewards good behavior, so most of the governing and the research can be left to their respective departments. Guided popular sovereignty works wonders. How do states and the press maintain their place at the top of their hierarchies? States compete with other states, both external states that might threaten it militarily or economically, and internal proto-states that challenge the state's authority. A state keeps other states out of its borders, or else it is conquered. A state keeps internal power struggles at bay. If it doesn't, there will be a competition for the state's monopoly on force, until one contender comes out on top. Wars are competitions between states. Revolutions, civil wars, riots, and all levels of civil unrest are part of the competition for the monopoly on force. Irish-English conflict, Sunni-Shia conflict, and even Democratic Party politics are all part of the struggle to establish control over the use of force. The press competes in a hierarchy for truth. There cannot be multiple competing truths, just like there cannot be multiple competing governments in one nation. The press, as defined in the First Amendment, is not a single entity, but a broad category of sources of information. There are many presses vying for control over the truth, just as there are many entities who want control over the government and the use of force. However, the press, as many Americans understand it, is the mainstream media. The name itself is an admission that out of all the competitors, there is one that is dominant. Many people, especially of the right, dislike the press intensely, but understand that it dictates the official approved truth, just as they understand that the U.S. government is in charge whether they like it or not. 
The mainstream press maintains its position at the top of the hierarchy because it does not tolerate competitors. It ruthlessly hunts down any alternatives with relentless bad coverage, which starves the alternative press of resources through social ostracization. If anyone creates alternative press, they must be silenced. If the people in government disobey, they must be voted out of power. The press is the distribution network of the cathedral's social control engine. Feed the public at large certain information and they will behave predictably. Most people are expected to be complicit or docile. Let's take one last dive into the letter and have Moldbug show us a bit about why people take instruction from the cathedral. Quote, let's take a hat tip from the blogosphere's invaluable inside source in the cathedral, Dr. Evil Timothy Burke, who links with applause to how this works. End quote. And then Moldbug, quoting Dr. Timothy Burke, Quote, in the early 21st century, there is no limit or constraint on the desire of public constituencies to profit from the perspective of a university-based historian. Even better, the usual lament of the humanities. There is plenty of money to support work in science and engineering, but very little to support work in the humanities. Proves to be accurate only if you define work in the humanities in the narrowest and most conventional way. If by that phrase you mean only individualistic research directed at arcane topics detached from real-world needs and written in an inaccessible and insular jargon, there is indeed very limited money. But for a humanities professor willing to take up applied work, sources of money are unexpectedly abundant. End quote. Then back to Moldbug. Quote, Applied work. I love the phrase. It belongs right up there with manipulating procedural outcomes. And what does the author, Professor Limerick, mean by applied work? End quote. Quoting Professor Limerick, quote, Another nearly completed project, The Nature of Justice, Racial Equity, and Environmental Well-Being, spotlights the involvement of ethnic minorities with environmental issues. The center works regularly with federal agencies ranging from the Environmental Protection Agency to the National Park Service, end quote. Back to Moldbug again. Quote, The involvement of ethnic minorities with environmental issues. You can't make this stuff up. I suppose she doesn't mean that they leave used diapers on the beach or engage in the ethnic cleansing of pelicans. I don't think I've linked to Miss Latt before. She appears to be a racist Jewish woman in her 50s. Her signature post is definitely this one, end quote. Here, Moldbug linked to some dead URLs that led to a blog by one Miss Latt. Quote, why is it that Professor Lemerick is not just regularly called upon to share her off room with the EPA, don't miss the picture, but apparently quite well compensated for it, whereas Miss Latt has no such opportunity to contribute her insights on the Mexican-Pelican interaction. Well, a lot of reasons, really, but the main one is that EPA, to sound like an insider, drop the article, recognizes Professor Limerick as an official authority. Uncle Sam may not tell the University of Colorado what to do, but the converse is not the case. And if you are a bureaucrat fighting for some outcome or other, and you can bring Professor Limerick in on your side, you are more likely to win. Apparently, she is compensated for the service. This is not surprising. If we lived in a theocracy as opposed to an atheocracy, she might be Bishop Limerick, and her thoughts would carry just the same weight. They might be different thoughts, of course. They probably would be. Frankly, I would much rather be governed by the Pope than by these people. At least it would be a change, and I do believe in change. End quote. Ten years later, we have excellent examples of what Moldbug was writing about. Very recently, the Dr. James Watson referenced in the previous video about this part of the letter was subjected to a typical defamation attack by the cathedral. Dr. Watson, the discoverer of the double helix structure of DNA, was excommunicated from the cathedral for his heretical propositions on the relationship between race, intelligence, and genetics. Perhaps this should feel like a chilling bit of synchronicity, that, as I am making videos on the very part of the letter in which Dr. Watson is referenced, he is slandered by the machinations of the cathedral. But in truth, I am not surprised at all. It should be expected, as the cathedral has grown more powerful, that it should deauthorize its own priests, such that they are no longer recognized as official authorities. Dr. Watson will not be sharing his off again. 
Dr. Watson has been discussed in many other videos recently, including a debate between a few famous political figures on YouTube. Closing the discussion, one of the moderators spoke of the responsibility of scientists to speak in a certain way, with the same language and tone as one would use when discussing the importance of how a priest speaks. Have a listen. Don't you feel like he has a responsibility as being somebody who is a scientist and whose opinion will, by default, be taken more seriously to take a larger amount of, uh, you know, caution whenever he's saying things like this that could be interpreted in a way? And I don't think you can necessarily treat the person who, even as you said, discovered DNA as just an average person who's talking about something that they don't know about, especially when it's so close to what he's actually so well known for. No, I, I don't think that's irresponsible at all. It's quite clear from the reverence in his tone of voice and his expectations of them that he views these university scientists in a fundamentally different way than all other people. He views them just like Christians view their priests. If there is one thing to understand from the letter, above all, as we close, it is that the atheists who worship at the altar of science may have no god, but they are just as religious as their most pious counterparts. Their priest caste is as real as the materials that these scientists operate on. Their commandments might be, Thou shalt not deny equality, Thou shalt not deny the climate, and so on. These people have subverted the protections that were supposed to be afforded by the First Amendment. The American society that was intended is gone. To have something like it again, this problem has to be formally dealt with. What I mean by this is a reference to the inaugural post of Moldbug's blog. Going for an even further blast from the past, in his first blog post, Moldbug writes, quote, Let's figure out exactly who has what now and give them a fancy little certificate. Let's not get into who should have what, because, like it or not, this is simply a recipe for more violence, end quote. And then, later on in the same post, Quote, whether we're talking about the U.S., Baltimore, or your wallet, a formalist is only happy when ownership and control are one in the same. To reformalize, therefore, we need to figure out who has actual power in the U.S. and assign shares in such a way as to reproduce this distribution as closely as possible. End quote. Moldbug's formalism proposes a solution that is not to fight the dark power of the cathedral, but simply to recognize it formally. Once it is recognized and given formal power, once power is transparent, people can understand who rules them and can decide whether or not they like it that way. If people like being commanded by lab coat frocked professors, they can remain in cathedral town. If not, they can leave and live somewhere that the cathedral does not have power. The solution is simply to have both clarity in government, specifically in power, and the choice of exit for the people. There is no need to wastefully fight over who is in charge. It is understood, and you can simply walk away if you don't like it. This is, of course, somewhat of a fantasy, but civilization has reached a state in which extraordinary means are required to avoid a violent dissolution of Western civilization. The purpose of these videos is to provide education that will be useful in preventing such an unfortunate outcome. Understanding that torching all of Western civilization in the process of saving it is no victory at all, and is a lesson that supersedes anything Moldbug has written. The narrow path that can be walked to an intact alternative is only available to those willing to act with discipline and a clear head. Thanks for watching. Next time we cover Moldbug, we will look at a few smaller and lesser known blog posts and learn from them as well.